scaled, finer scale patterns that even within the same area. And we talked about that a little bit in, in with reference to adaptation f and right that you can try and pull these things apart. But um, but S is so often the case in this or any other branch of science. Many of the things that we would love to be able to measure, unfortunately, we just can't measure right now. Um, but luckily, it means it doesn't mean that you just can't ask any questions at all. It just means that you might have to work extra hard to be able to figure out how to ask a good question. So let's have a little bit of a look at, um, at what this uh, Wager et al. paper did. And, um, and then we can chat a little bit. Hopefully, we'll have some time to chat a little bit about you know, any kind of big picture questions you have about the class or anything like that. You could just you know, eat some more donuts. OK, there's a lot going on in this picture. So let's just sort of go through it just a little bit. OK, so, so this top bit is the main thing. So, so they, ex they exposed people to different levels of pain, and they measured their brain activation, and they trained a, a, a classifier, in this case, a regression, regression meaning that you're trying to fit a continuous function. And they said, um, you know, can I, can I attribute weights? Can I assign weights to different voxels? Some positive, some negative. The positive ones would mean if there's more activation in that voxel, then the classifier thinks that they're experiencing more pain. Negative weight would mean if there's more activation, it thinks that they're experiencing less pain. And uh, what do I get? And then, you know, there's lots of different ways of divide, designing such a regression. They use one which has a sort of sparsity constraint in it that is called lasso, that means basically that you try not to have too many voxels. It tries to pick out just sort of the best ones. Um, and they also did uh, what they call principal components regression, which basically means you try to sort of reduce the dimensionality of your space and then look at that, rather than looking at thousands and thousands of voxels. You know, if you're interested, we can, I mean, well, we can also look at the, the paper itself, but we can talk more about that later. But basically, they just try to sort of constrain. This is something you have to do with classifiers, or in fact, even with any sort of statistical model. You want to sort of constrain it. You want to give it as little freedom as it can have such that they can still fit the data. And so that's what they did. And, uh, and look, what, what, look what came out. Okay, so here's our favorite region again, dorsal anterior singular. Here's the insula. Um, and then there's some sort of uh, thalamus stuff going on here as well. Some motor area stuff going on here. They were experiencing the pain, I think on their arm or maybe their hand, but so this, this motor area is sort of probably related to that. Maybe the thalamic area as well. So what they find, found is that using some of these sort of regions that have actually been found to be pain-related regions, they could actually train their classifier to um, match to a reasonably good degree the level to which people were actually behaviorally reporting, yeah, this hurts. And they got people to report the amount that it hurt on a scale, I think, from 0 to 200 or something. Okay? So, um, so, so that's what all these curves are here. Okay. So here's the here's behavior, pain report. You probably can't see this text from where it's sitting. Okay. So this is the sort of subjective report measure, and this is what the class, how much pain the classifier thinks they're in, and this is a sort of big cloud of dots with lots of lines in it that's sort of going upwards. Okay. So the fact that it's sort of going upwards means, yeah, you know, the more pain they were in, the more the classifier thought they were having pain. The fact that it's a reasonably tightish cloud and not just a completely circular cloud means that there's actually a decent correlation here. So the classifier was doing quite well. And the fact that there's lots of different lines here means it was doing quite well across lots of different people. Okay, now this is very interesting. This sort of relates to uh, the question that, uh, that Megan was asking here. So pain versus other affective meaning emotional events. Okay. So this red line here is, um, so this thing's signature response, they're calling this thing, this set of neural activations here, their pain signature, okay? So the degree to which, you know, you take your activation, these voxels, stick it into your regression, degree to which the regression comes out saying, yeah, a lot of pain, or no, not very much pain, that's your pain signature, that's what they're calling it, okay? So this red line here is their response to physical heat, and as the heat gets hotter and hotter and hotter, so down here is like around, I think, you know, 40 degrees C or something, which feels warm, but it's no big deal. Up here is around 50 degrees C, which kind of hurts. It's not actually going to cook your skin, but it really hurts you. Um, and uh, as you go up and up and up, 
the, the prediction of the classifier says, yeah, they should be having more and more pain. So that's good. But here's a really nice control, and this is the kind of thing that, that helps to get at this question of specificity. Um, and I'll go into just to do a refresher in just a second of the sort of technical meaning of specificity. But this is to say, OK, I want to make sure that I'm sort of getting at actual pain and not just sort of stuff that makes me feel bad. Okay? Um, because, well, here's something that will make you feel bad. I want you to remember a time when you experienced some really pain, some nasty pain, right? That's actually not a very pleasant memory. Right? Oh, here's another one. You're in a study, and you know that you're about to get that this thing on your arm is about to hurt you. Okay, that's an unpleasant feeling too, right? The anticipation of pain, but it's not the same thing as actually feeling pain. Right? So, so a good classifier would actually be able to tell the difference. A good classifier meaning good. What does good mean? Good means that's actually measuring what we hope it's measuring. Okay, that's actually measuring actual physical pain, and not sort of unpleasant thoughts. Right? Well, here's two types of unpleasant thoughts. I mean, there's like a, a green line and a blue line. I'm not actually sure which one's which, but they're pretty much overlapping. Um, what this says pain recall. This says pain anticipation. Okay. So even if you're thinking, oh, I'm about to experience some really nasty pain, neurally that is different and moreover distinguishable using this uh, regression from actually experiencing the pain. So that's just, this is a little bit like sort of, you know, sort of pain imagery versus pain experience. Okay, now what's going on here? This is called the receiver operator characteristic curve. Many of you, have, how many of you have seen a receiver operator, ROC curve, the receiver operator characteristic curve before? Okay, about half of you. That's sort of like, if you're in a more sort of numerical, technically type field, then you'll, you'll see these kind of things. But it's really plotting exactly the same stuff that we've been talking about. So I just want to quickly remind you, and if you go to med school or if you're planning on going to med school, you will have to think about this kind of stuff. Okay. So I just want to quickly remind you what specificity and sensitivity are. Um, this is just a slide that we used last week. So specificity is, oh, well, let's do sensitivity first. If something really is happening, in this case, if someone really is in pain, how often do you say, yeah, they're in pain? All right? So sensitive, sensitive is a good label, because it kind of means what it says it means. Okay? Specificity is sort of the converse. It says, <coughs> if somebody really isn't in pain, how often do you say, yeah, they're not in pain? Okay? In other words, you're not always saying, you're not always producing lots of false positives, and here you're not producing lots of misses. Okay? Um, and so, so what these, uh, what these curves, this is probably a bit small for you to see, but what these curves plot, and this is how these kind of curves always plot, it's called a receiver operator characteristic curve. The reason why people think, worry about sensitivity and specificity is because like, like we were chatting about last week, dependent, you can easily sort of play with your threshold to be perfectly sensitive. Like you can always say, yeah, they're in pain, yeah, they're in pain, yeah, they're in pain. But that's not very useful because you're going to get lots of false positives. Similarly, you can make sure you don't have any false positives by never saying that anybody's in pain. That's not very useful either. So you want to kind of strike some sort of balance. And um, if you shift your threshold, you might not actually alter the sort of ability of your machinery to detect what it's trying to detect at all. You might just shift your threshold around, and you'll be in uh, sort of different places on this balance. And that's exactly what's shown in, the, uh, in these sort of curves. So, so there's curves here. They're kind of hard to see because they go very far up into this corner. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. But um, so this here is 1 minus specificity, which I think, let me make, let me make sure I say this right. Uh, OK, specificity is uh, how often you don't give a false alarm. Is that right? I want to make sure I say this right. OK, specificity is someone doesn't have pain, and you say, yeah, they're not in pain. OK, so that's. That's a failure to give a false alarm. OK, so 1 minus specificity. I mean, an actual more, a more informative label here would be false alarms. Okay? So um, if you're down here, you have zero false alarms. If you're over here, you have lots of false alarms. Sensitivity, that's a little bit easier to think about. That's how many hits you get. So a really good system would get lots and lots of hits without making too many false alarms. Right? 
because it's easy to get hits if you're willing to make false alarms because you just say, yeah, they're in pain, yeah, 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 okay? So a really good system, and, and as, you, as, you, um, as you kind of vary your threshold, you're gonna move along different places of this curve. So down here, this is where you're kind of very, very conservative, and you hardly ever say that you've actually detected anything, and you're really trying hard not to get any false alarms, but you might be less sensitive. An example of this would be something like, um, uh, say, the criminal justice system. Okay? We do not want to put innocent people in jail, and we're willing to let some people get away with it because we don't want to put innocent people in jail. Right? If there's any reasonable doubt whatsoever, you have to let them go. Right? Now, because the cost of you know, putting someone, it's really bad to put an innocent person in jail. Okay? So that's an example of being sort of down here. You, you're really trying hard not to get false alarms and you're willing to sacrifice a few hits. Okay. Over here would be a case where you don't, you, you, you just want to get a lot of hits and you don't really mind if you get too many false alarms. An example might be, you know, I don't know, screening for some highly infectious disease. Okay, you want to make sure you get everybody who has this disease. You don't want to miss anybody. And if, even if you get a false alarm, the worst case scenario is you're like, oh, well, you know, we tested you again and it turns out it was wrong, but hey, at least you haven't gone off and infected everybody in the neighborhood, so that's good. Okay. So depending upon what you want, you have these different, different criteria. But a, a perfect test, okay, a perfect test would, would you could rack up your um, sensitivity and you still wouldn't get false alarms because it's just so good. And, and, and that kind of test would end up right in this far corner here, right in the top. So if you ever look at receiver operating characteristic curve, or ROC curve, that often called, Something that does really well will be way up in the, everything will be up in the corner here. And something that's just sort of guessing would be a diagonal line here. Okay, if you study signal detection theory, you'll get lots of this kind of stuff. But also, if you study medicine, you'll have to learn about, a lot about specificity and sensitivity. Or in fact, if you ever measure, ever measure anything where people might have a variable threshold, which is kind of lots of things, actually, especially if someone's subjectively <coughs> reporting something, then this is often a useful way of plotting it. Okay, I don't want to go into that in too much detail. But the, 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 the punchline is these curves are way up in this corner, and that means it's doing really well. Okay? You, can, you, you, you can get tons of hits without racking up too many false alarms. That's a sign of a good system. Um, another sign of a good system is it actually can capture this uh, uh, continuous nature. That's one of the reasons why this thermal pain measure is good. You can you say, okay, I'm going to have give them 44 degrees centigrade, 45 degrees centigrade, 46 degrees centigrade, and just smoothly turn up. And as, as you turn that up, their amount of reported pain goes up and up. And this signature response, meaning the, the output of their re regression classifier, that goes up and up and up too. Okay, so that's good. It's doing what it thinks it should be doing. Um, this one is... Uh, categorizing things as whether they're painful or non-painful, um, and you get the same kind of result, so that's good. This one is actually interesting. This one relates to this, uh, oh no, sorry, I'm gonna skip this one. Well, uh, this is the same thing, pain versus no pain. Now you can see, now you can see a bigger version of the receiver operating characteristic of, you're, you're probably, for those of you who've never seen one of these before, this will not be the last time you see one of these things. I hope it will be a little bit less mysterious the next time you look at one. Um, this is distinguishing uh, pain from other things that are not actually pain. So pain versus almost painful, or pain versus it's warm but it's not really hurting you yet. And again, it does a good job. The curves are all up in this corner. So this, this classifier is actually kind of measuring what it thinks it should be measuring. And, and here's a bit that relates interestingly to what we were looking at before. Okay. So, if social pain is really exactly, exactly the same thing as physical pain, well, in a certain level, it can't be, it can't be exactly the same thing, right? Because otherwise, it would literally be the case that, um, you know, I'm walking along and I stub my toe and I'm like, oh man, my friends have just rejected me, right? Okay. <laughs> We are able to tell the difference. Okay, so something inside is different. Okay? And yet, there does psychologically seem to be some kind of relation between them. There neurally seems to be some kind of relation. Well, how deep is that relation? Well, we saw this example, this sort of reverse inference of, you know, just because they're in the same brain area doesn't mean the same thing's going on. So, well, that's, that's a nice sort of broad general logical point, but it would be good to sort of get, you know, see that in a little bit more detail and say, okay, well, 
let's look inside that brain area and let's actually, let's actually see if we really can tell them apart. You know, not just in some sort of in principle logical argument sort of way. Let's go do it. Okay. So, um, so here is this, this curve here is uh, pain versus rejector, okay, and rejector versus friend. The like light blue and dark blue curves, which might be a bit hard to see. So they literally, this is I think study three. There's a lot of stuff that's going on in this paper. Um, so they had a whole study in which they recruited people who had recently experienced a romantic breakup. Okay. I guess this was on a university campus, so there were lots of people like that. <laughs> um, and we've all experienced it. We've probably, if you if you've never experienced this in your life, you're very lucky. But you know, probably we've all experienced this, and it, it hurts. Okay, it's very unpleasant. Okay, um, so you know, my hats off to these people for actually volunteering for this study. So this is, I know it would have been interesting to to actually have done this. But um, they literally got the people to give them a photo of the person who rejected them, and they showed them that photo. I'm not making this up, go look at the paper. Okay, because, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a very good stimulus, right? Okay, I mean, I, I mean, the people, it was all informed consent, the people knew what was going on, they knew that they were about to see this picture, they already had the picture, it's not like they'd, it's not like, it's not like they would, had forgotten that they'd experienced a romantic rejection and, you know, they suddenly were re-traumatized by seeing this picture. They knew. They gave yeah. the people the picture in the first place. So everyone knew what they were doing, and that's very important. Okay? Everyone was... Um, but that's kind of an interesting design, right? And, and that's a good illustration of how people have to work very hard and do very imaginative things to actually study these, these questions that, uh, that are kind of hard to get at. And, and notice that they didn't just do the same thing as in the original eisenberg Vidal study of like the people throwing the balls, right? Because, you know, you saw the surfer dude, right? And he was like, well, I don't know if he was a surfer dude, but the sort of laid back, the third person, he was like, yeah, they weren't throwing the ball to me. Oh, I don't care, it's just a game, right? Everybody, by, you know, they selected people specifically. They say, have you experienced, I, don't, I mean, you can look in their supplementary information to see what their recruiting criteria were. But they actually say, you know, have you experienced a painful uh, romantic rejection? And would you be willing to do the study and give us a picture of the person who dumped you? So everybody in the study felt social pain when they saw that picture. Okay? It's, a very, it's a very inventive design. I mean, you know, my hat's off to these people. Um, and, uh, okay, so... So they've got a good, real, behaviorally relevant social pain stimulus that they know people are not just going to sort of brush off and say, ha, hey, yeah, I don't really care, because we've so they selected them specifically to care. So they're making life purposefully difficult for themselves, right, which is good. And then they're saying, OK, given all of that, can we tell the difference between the physical pain and the social pain? And this is the same subject, this sort of goes back to our study, this is another instance of the same subjects in the same study in the same scans. So these people got the thermal pain and they got, you know, they got shown the picture of the person who recently dumped them. And the answer is, okay, so here's pain versus rejector, that's this sort of blue line here. Oh, and then they also, as a control condition, you've got to have your good control conditions. Um, uh, also, they see a picture of someone who's just like their friend. So, you know, you have similar sort of stimulus on someone's face, but it's not causing social pain. So, so can, the, can the classifier actually tell the difference between physical pain versus seeing this picture of the person who rejected you? And the answer is yes. Okay, that's this blue line here, and it's kind of up in this corner, which means, just to re recap, that you're getting a lot of hits and not very many false alarms. In other words, it's doing the right thing. So what does this mean? Well, what this means is that, well, because what this means is still being actively debated, right? Okay, there's not, nothing in this is like the last word at all, okay? Not clinically, not socially, not neurally, not in terms of how they did the classification. It's a very, very good study, but of course, like anything else, it's not the last word on it. Um, but it means that you can actually neurally tell the difference, even within the anterior cingulate <laughs> cortex, this brain area that allegedly is sort of the, you know, social pain or physical pain area. Even within that area, you can actually tell the difference between um, social pain and physical pain. And that's, from a clinical point of view, that's really good. Because we don't want to say, you know, oh man, this person who, say, you know, is, is unable to report their states because they have dementia or something, according, we've put them in a scanner and it says that they're experiencing pain, let's give them some painkiller. And it turns out that they actually were, you know, feeling bad about a breakup. Well, I mean, it would, 
it's clinically not what you want to do. I mean, as long as you're not going to overdose on the painkiller, it might not necessarily cause any severe adverse effects, but you, you, you want to give people painkiller at the right time and not just in a sort of very willy-nilly, non-specific way. So, I, so I, you know, there's multiple reasons why I like this study. I mean, first of all, because it's just a beautiful study and it's clinically important, but also it kind of relates to this interesting logical question that's been sort of floating around in literature quite a long time, which is, you know, just because two things are in the same area, can you really tell them apart? And, and this is a nice illustration of yes, but it might not be easy. You might have to use quite sophisticated technique. Um, anyway, okay, so, so that's enough about that. So, uh, so in the last couple of minutes, so it, I, my, you know, my biggest hope is that you've, you know, found this sort of interesting and learned something. Uh, so, you know, if there's nothing else that I hope to con convey that you can look at the structure of neural representations with fMRI, and you don't just have to say, does something light up? That's not really an interesting question anymore. Maybe it was back in the day. Similarly, if you're, if you're about to hand in a project that's basically saying, we're going to see what lights up for some particular um, you know, task, then you know, we should talk because, I mean, that's a perfect, I mean, you know, that's not a terrible, terrible question, but it's not really as interesting as it could be. Um, and it, at its best, and this, this is a very high bar, but I think it's a bar worth striving for, and we've shown some very explicit examples of things that really do achieve this, that imaging can provide information over and above what can be learned from behavior. And that's a high bar, not because imaging is not very good at providing information, but because behavior is really good at providing information. Right? You want to find out how much pain someone's in? Ask them. Right? And in almost all circumstances, that's the best you can ever do. Right? But for some people, if they've got dementia or they're a child or they're in a vegetative state, you can't just ask them. Well, but look at the Adrian Oliver <coughs> last, last, that we looked at last week, where he literally asked the person, if you're in pain, imagine playing tennis and the person, if you're not, imagine you know, walking through a house or whatever, and the person answered no, luckily. Right? They might have said yes, and that would have been kind of difficult. Um, so that's going beyond behavior. We looked at the dyslexia paper where they sort of prospectively following people up over two and a half years and saying who's, whose reading is going to get better, whose reading is not going to get better. Turns out that the behavioral measures don't actually predict that very well. The neural measures actually add something beyond that. So, so this can actually be done, but it's not easy. But I think it's worth trying to strive towards. So, so those, are, you know, those are probably the main things that I'm trying to, uh, trying to convey. Uh, for this particular class, an important takeaway is that all these donuts need to be eaten. Because <laughs> first of all, I do not want to be in a situation where it's just me in a large box of donuts. <laughs> I just don't want to. So please have some more donuts. And we've got like five minutes. Um, so are there any general things, questions, comments, thoughts about fMRI, thoughts about anything, <coughs> worries about project, and uh, just anything? Or you know, questions about what flavor of donut we have? Stuff like that. It's a sorted, by the way, if you don't know what the is. No. I mean, has uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, well, this is just a broad question about uh, kind of what do you think is the future of fMRI, and do you think we could create a portable machine? Oh, well, that's, that's a very good question. There are actually, there, you know, there exists some papers called, you know, like the future of fMRI. People write these sort of things. I mean, of course, nobody really, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. fMRI certainly is not going to become portable anytime soon, although there are, well, certainly it's too strong a word, but, you know, a proper good high resolution scanner is, it's very hard physically to make a small thing. But there is type, there are, there is imaging, different types of imaging that literally is a cap that you can attach to your head, in particular EEG and this thing called NIRS that I haven't talked about, it's like near infrared spectroscopy. And that's great, for instance, for um, say babies who move their head a lot, that you know, the cap moves with them. And there is these days mobile EEG, in fact, I can play with this a bit, you can buy a headset for 300 bucks that is like, a, it's, you know, it's got like 14 channels, so it's not a really top-notch EEG headset. It has a little wireless, it has a Wi-Fi thing on it, and there's no big cable coming out the back of your head, and you can actually walk around. Now, when you walk around with this thing on, it shakes around on your head, and it really messes up the signal, but it doesn't completely mess up the signal. So it's, um, so that's kind of about as close as we've got right now to something that's portable. But it's a very, you know, as you can imagine, the sort of trade-offs, right? So you can have something that you can wear on your head as you walk around, but you're not going to get nearly the same type of 
signal quality or you know actual imaging from inside the head as you would with something that's a big multi-million dollar machine that fills a whole room. But who knows? Who knows how that's going to change? But I mean, there are physical reasons why it's going to be very, very difficult to make an actual MRI machine um, that you can move around with. But you know, people are working on these kind of problems. So you know, let's see. Let's see. Um, what else? Has anyone sort of uh, has anyone come away from this thinking fMRI is, is is the worst thing ever? I never, you know, and because because fMRI does have a bad reputation. But there's there's a lot of people who, especially in sort of cognitive psychology, would say, oh, fMRI, you know, those are those guys who you know just show like blobs, you know, blobology. It's the new phrenology. It's just showing pictures of what lit up. I mean, what I hope. I hope what I've, I hope is the, that I've shown is that yes, there are a lot of fMRI studies like that, but no, it doesn't have to be like that. It's just more difficult to go beyond that. The easiest thing in the world is to to just say, you know, hey, let's see what lights up, and you know, ready. yeah, Dave. Well, so here's here's a uh, a related question. Um, how is showing uh, how how is it any different to say? Uh, when we had people do task X versus task Y, task Y, we, we found this sort of disuse blob of activation in the area X versus when we had people look at stimulus X and stimulus Y, we found that the pattern of activation of voxels in area Y uh, or area A could distinguish between those. Okay, I see what you're saying. So, so if you, instead of saying, hey, let's look at just kind of, you know, how much did this area light up, you say, oh, well, instead of saying, Ta-da, you know, this bit of your head lights up more. You say, ta-da, this bit of your head contains information-bearing patterns of activation. I completely agree with you, and in fact, this is, I sort of mentioned that in the last like, email I said out there. This is why I think it's important to bear in mind, and I've tried, been trying to stress a little bit, that there's a lot more that you can do with looking at these multi patterns than basically just asking the same old questions, but maybe with greater sensitivity or something like that. So yes, it is the case that Things might, you know, you might have two patterns that might have the same average mean activation, but different patterns, and you can tell them apart now, and you couldn't before. But if your end result is, yeah, you know, this bit of your head contains some information, that's not necessarily any more interesting or any more informative, right? But you can do lots more than that. Okay, so once you start looking at uh, multi voxel patterns, all of a sudden they don't just go up and down, but you have similarity relations between them. You can say, aha, there's a structure here. Right? This pattern is more similar to that one and less similar to that one. You can say, how does that relate to the structure in the world? Right? If I've got, um, we saw, for example, the Jack Gallen work is a really nice illustration of this with Tom Mitchell work. Same in Tom Mitchell's work. The word table is semantically more related to the word chair than it is to the word dog. Right? Okay? And, so, and, and in exactly the same way, you can find a greater neural similarity between the words table and chair than between the word table and dog. So there's a structure out there in the world, not necessarily a physical structure, it might be a sort of logical structure or a structure of meaning, and there's ways in which our brain actually represents that structure, and we can actually find some aspects of that. So, and, and none of the things that I just said hinge at all on which bit of your head this is in, right? This is to do with the relation between different <coughs> representations. So that's something, that's what I'm trying to talk about here, the structure of representation. So in fact, it's a very common thing to take this sort of I mean, Krieger's quarter, who I think is you know, the greatest researcher in this area, uh, came up with a searchlight approach, but unfortunately, and this is not his fault at all, but often the searchlight approach just sort of gets used to say like, oh, you know, this bit of your head contains information, that bit of your head contains information. I mean, that's a notch or two maybe more interesting than saying it lit up, but it's still not really the ultimate, in my view, not really what we should kind of care about. I mean, how does this, the, the, the question is, we've got this amazing thing in our heads that helps us to navigate and deal with this big, complicated, unpredictable world. How on earth does it do it? Right? That's the thing we're trying to understand. Not like, you know, is this bit doing or that bit doing it? So, what else do you think? How many donuts do we have? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I will Nobody consider this. Room for the donut room. I will, yeah, no, that's right. Nobody, nobody leaves till the donuts. We've got like. Uh, We've got uh, nine donuts. Okay, so we need nine donuts to be eaten. But actually, people can leave the room right now. <laughs> but anyway, so I hope you found an interesting class. And um, yeah, it, if you're worried or concerned about the project, please, please talk to me. I do not want anyone to be stressed about it. I mean, obviously, it's somewhat stressful because you have to write the thing and hand it in. But you know, the purpose is not to like you know 
make people freak out about it. Uh, I, I've already talked with somebody about that. And, uh, and the easiest thing, the single easiest thing you can do to improve your grade, if you haven't done it already, is send in answers to the mini questions that you haven't already sent in. And they will take me very little time to grade at all. That's basically, yeah, okay, this person now sent it in. That's easy. The thing I need more time for is the projects, okay? So, um, you know, and especially if you're a graduating senior, please, please get the project in sooner because I need to, like, grade it and hand in those grades sooner. Otherwise, the university will get my issue. So, uh, so thank you very much. If you decide that you want to do more of this, you know, I'm going to be doing work in this. Is uh, Brad Mahone and Jessica Camlin in, in our department to do this. Dick Aslin is director of the Brain Imaging Center. Uh, you know, you can talk with any of us and see what kind of opportunities there are. There's talks that happen. There's, there's lots of ways of learning more about this if, if this hasn't turned you off too much. Anyway, in the meantime, have some donuts. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, okay. There is a fantastic Well, if you want to, we can chat about it because I know we talked about it. You want to stick a little conclusion? Yeah, so I don't need it. Yeah, I mean, conclusion can be the most boring. It doesn't have to be the most boring. Yeah, we just want to flourish. I had to be so overrun. That's fine too. I don't care. You know, I mean, it doesn't have to be like a work of literature. Yeah, you just be like. So, what have we learned? Yeah. Well, this is what we know, yeah. and this is what we don't yeah. know, and this would be a good thing to look at. That's a perfect good thing. Yeah. 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 yeah, but I would worry more about the other things. I'm not worried. Well, I should have worried. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that. So I, I, I think it's when I go through it, I will. I, I don't think if you are missing any, then I'll send you. I, I should have already sent that. But I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's some people who hardly send it. Um, and the second thing is my uh, grandfather for Scotland is due on Thursday. Oh, well, that's my So, yeah, so I was using this kind of as the same thing, but then I realized what oh, I was writing is like yeah, pretty much all wrote in a single unit with like a small paragraph about okay. well, this If you education. would like the. So your grandfather's was going to be much more important than this or any other class. So but if you would like me to like try and it's still on Thursday. Yeah. Well I'm also not a student. I'm a tech. So but that it doesn't no, I'm just saying like when you get my grade in doesn't really matter. Oh, maybe. So much. Okay, I mean, I think it matters more. Like, it, yeah, it matters more. But if you want, if you want to like send me a draft of your, you know, St. Andrews thing, yeah. then I can try and have a look at that, and I can maybe try and have a look at it before Thursday. Like, no, I'm just, I was just going to say that like. What so, I can yeah. definitely look at is I can have a look at like you know the opening couple of paragraphs because I keep on yeah. hammering on about are actually by far the most important bit. Yeah, mine's kind of rambling, but so. Well, I mean, so okay, I mean, so send me, like, send me your opening couple. Forget the project for a minute. Your, 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 I mean, your, 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 your grandfather's important, and I would be more and more than happy if you send me literally just an opening paragraph and some comments in that. And, and I'm not kidding. I, I if you get your opening paragraph really good, that's like 80%. I mean, I, that may be an exaggeration, but 